Good evening. I am Brooke Clement. I'm the director here at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, which is part of the National Archives and Records Administration. And it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight. Thank you, as always, for your commitment to the Library and Museum as we close out our 2024 programming here. And as always, I want to give a shout out to our, our good partners, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, for supporting programs like this. Um, before we begin, can you please be sure that your cell phones are turned off or placed on silent? One quick reminder, we do have HW Brands coming to the museum in Grand Rapids as our guest on November 7th, where he's going to be discussing the significance of the Ford administration and America's role in a complex world. And now I have the honor of introducing the two gentlemen you're going to be hearing from tonight. Joel Westfall, the Deputy Director of the Ford Library and Museum, will be our moderator this evening. And joining him is author and professor Dr. Scott Kaufman. Dr. Kaufman is a Francis Marion University Board of Trustees research scholar, and he joined the staff at that university in 2001. He is the author, co-author, or editor of 12 books on diplomatic, presidential, and military history, including Project Plowshare, the Peaceful Use of Nuclear Explosives in Cold War America, Rosalind Carter, Equal Partner in the White House, Plans Unraveled, the Foreign Policy of the Carter Administration, and Ambition, Pragmatism, and Party, a biography of Gerald R. Ford. Please join me in welcoming these two to the stage. Thank you. It's on. Is it, is it on? Oh, yeah. I'm not hitting the wrong button here. I think we're going to need some help. Sarah? <laughs> I can talk really loudly. Oh, of course, it's on now. Thank you. Just give it two seconds. Turn oh, I see. You press that power button. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. I think we're good now. Let's make sure All right. it's working. Yeah. I think that'll be the end of the technical difficulties, let's hope. <laughs> so first of all, welcome back uh, to the Ford. Um, and uh, thank you for once again coming here during our 50th anniversary kind of celebration of the 38th President of the United States. Let's get into the questions. So before we do get into Ford, uh, let's talk about legacy in the general sense. Uh, one of the reasons your bio of Ford is my all-time favorite, I have actually read it twice, is that you pull no punches in it. It is what I like to call a warts and all biography. I think too many biographers fall deeply in love with the individual on whom they write about. They often turn into very gushy affairs of the heart rather than the much needed independent investigation and analysis that's required. After all, to err is human. My question, legacy, legacy building should never be the goal of the biographer. Am I correct in saying this? If we're using the term legacy in terms of the impact an individual had, I mean, we could talk about, the, for instance, the impact Ronald Reagan had on American politics or that Franklin Roosevelt had on American politics. I mean, certainly that would be something you would probably want to look at as a biographer. Where you want to be careful is empathizing too much. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, when you write a biography, and this especially for, for our students who are here, uh, if you think about writing a biography, one thing you want to do is to certainly try to get into the mind of that individual. What influenced them? Where were they raised? How did their environment, not just the, the environment, the, the physical environment, but their family, their teachers, their coaches, in the case of Ford, for instance, uh, their, um, the events that, that affected them, how did all of those things affect who they became? And that means stepping into the shoes of that individual mm. to really understand who they are, what they thought, why they thought that way, the decisions they made, why they made those decisions. That means, in other words, empathizing with them. Where you can run into danger 
is if you are un unable or unwilling to step outside, step out of those shoes. I think a great example of this is the historian Arthur Link. Uh, some of you may have heard of Arthur Link. He wrote a number of books on Woodrow Wilson. And his critics said that really what it came down to is he could see Wilson as someone who really did no wrong. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm, almost, I'm almost quoting him exactly. He said that um, with the exception of Jesus, St. Paul, and the prophets, Woodrow Wilson was the historical figure he most admired. And he called Woodrow Wilson a man of, and I'm quoting, absolute integrity. Well, I mean, if you look at Woodrow Wilson's foreign policies toward Latin America, his treatment of African Americans, we could strongly question that. So you have to be willing to step outside those shoes. So step outside the shoes, and then from a distance, again, look at this individual and try to understand from a distance the decisions they made. Why did they make those decisions? Were they good decisions? What impact did they have for better or for worse? That is what I think a biographer needs to do. Then at that point, you can assess legacies. But again, you should do so from a distance rather than allowing yourselves to get so caught up in that person that you are unable to see maybe, for instance, the errors they made. Thank you, thank you. My follow-up was gonna, why, why do so many fall flat? But I think you've already answered that question. <laughs> um, uh, next one, during uh, many of our recent 50th anniversary lectures, the topic of the pardon, of course, has been front and center. Uh, many of our previous lectures had a variety of opinions on it. Barry Worth, for example, stated that it was the right thing to do at the wrong time, that Ford should have waited until Nixon was actually indicted uh, before issuing the pardon. Others have said that the message, messaging was bad, for example, the timing of the announcement. Others have claimed that A.G. Jaworski wanted nothing to do with actually prosecuting Nixon. What is your view of the pardon when it comes to Ford's legacy? Um, right decision, I, I share very worth. Right decision, wrong time. Um, let's talk first of all about the pardon itself. So, so why did Ford make this decision? Um, Ford was only in office for, for a month. Uh, when he decided to, to pardon Nixon. And there were several things that, that he began to think about. One of them was the fact that in his first press conference, about a quarter of the questions he was asked were, were about Nixon. What are your plans? Are you going to pardon him? Now, again, it's only about a, a quarter of the questions. But he started to think to himself, my gosh, am I going to be asked about Nixon at every single press conference, what I plan on doing, I have what I think are more important issues that I want to deal with that I think the American people need to worry about. The economy, energy, as a couple of examples. Uh, second of all, he was, he was worried about whether Nixon could receive a fair trial. And that wasn't just his concern. Leon Jaworski was worried about, A, how long it would take to actually get together a jury of peers, and B, um, how long the trial itself would last. And during that, that could, that could take years. And all that time, you have that Nixon issue hanging over Ford when he wants to focus on other things. He also was worried about Nixon's health. Uh, he had sent uh, a man named Benton Becker, a, uh, a, a law professor from Miami, to, uh, to California to talk to Nixon about getting a statement of contrition. Um, and he asked Becker, tell me about, what, how does Nixon look? And Becker said, the guy looks like, his, I mean, I'm paraphrasing him, but looks like on his deathbed. He does not look well. And Ford began to think to himself, this guy's been through enough. So I think it is time that I look at giving, giving him a pardon. I will, I will get the issue off my plate. I will be able to focus uh, more on these other issues that I think that are more important. I think Nixon's been through enough. But let's think about the timing here. Let's jump back to the 60s, all right? We have the credibility gap, this, this distrust of our elected officials, whether they're telling us the truth. This begins as early as 1965, 1966. Are our elected officials telling us the truth about what's happening, for instance, in Vietnam? Are they not, are they telling us the whole story? You have the Tet Offensive, where, which occurs in, in, uh, in uh, January of 68. Americans had been told prior to that uh, we're winning the war, the body counts prove it. William Westmoreland, the, ge the commanding general in Vietnam, saying, I see the end of the road coming soon. We could probably bring the boys back within a couple of years. 
Then you have the Tet Offensive, over 200 locations attacked in South Vietnam, Amer by the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Regular Army, and Americans asking themselves, how could this have happened? I thought the war was almost over, we're winning, unless we've been lied to by, by our leaders. And then, of course, you have Watergate. Ford decides to pardon Nixon only a month after taking office. And it led Americans who were already questioning the trustworthiness of their leaders, of their officials in Washington, whether there was some kind of a conspiracy here. Uh, that what happened was Nixon said to Ford, I will resign and you can become president if you give me a pardon in return. And I can tell you looking at some of the letters that were written to Ford or to members of Congress, this is something that they truly believe was the case. The other thing to think about here is the midterm elections are coming up. The 1974 midterm ele elections are coming up in November. You have members of Congress, especially well, Republican members, who are very worried about the effects of Watergate. They're running for election or running for re-election. And I interviewed a number of members, of former members of Congress when I was writing this book, including Richard Lugar, who later served in the US Senate, Bob Dole, who was a senator, uh, they're running for election or re-election. Ford issues the pardon. And Dole's going, oh my gosh, you just threw an anchor and I'm sinking thanks to you. Luger's worried about whether he can actually win the seat. Had Ford waited until after the midterms, I don't see why that would have been impossible for him. It would have only meant a couple of additional months. I'm not saying it would have prevented the Democrats from winning more seats in Congress. But it certainly caused a lot of damage to the Republican Party, and it certainly raised questions about Ford's trustworthiness. I mean, his approval rating, which had been in the 70s, plummeted as a result of the pardon. It was the right decision. It would have, I mean, to have this trial go on and on, setting it up to go on and on and on, the way it might have divided the country, the way it would have diverted attention from other issues, I think it was the right decision to make. But just the timing of it raised so many questions, not just in the minds of Americans, but also added to the concerns of the Republican Party. Uh, for Republicans, the timing was really bad. Yeah. Thank you, great. Let's discuss uh, Helsinki and uh, Vladivostok. Your book discusses both. Uh, Ford had a major breakthrough in November of 74 in Vladivostok in what would eventually lead to the SALT II Treaty and followed this up with his trip to Helsinki in 75 in which he was pilloried by Reagan and the far-right conservatives for attending. How do these two events stack up when it comes to the legacy of President Ford? Okay. Um, before I answer that question, I want to say one more thing about the pardon. And this does concern the issue of legacy. Um, one of the things that I think people are going to ask is whether Ford left a legacy that future presidents are going to be pardoned by their predecessors. I think it's important to point out presidents are humans. They don't have crystal balls. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. And just because of what, what President Ford did doesn't require a future president to do the same thing. So that out of the way. Um, with regard, with regard to Vladivostok and Helsinki, let me take these separately. Sure. So with Vladivostok, the Vladivostok Accords of 1974 um, can be traced back to the SALT agreements of, of 1972, signed right. between um, Richard Nixon and Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev. Now, the SALT-1 agreement, the SALT agreement, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaties, the SALT-1 agreement was asymmetrical. What it did is it focused on um, ballistic missile systems, or ballistic systems. Uh, intercontinental systems, excuse me, intercontinental systems. So we're talking about uh, land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles launched from silos. We're talking about submarine launched ballistic missiles, and we're talking about long-range bombers with intercontinental capability. What SALT did is restricted the number of those launchers, of those systems, to about 2,500 for the Soviets and to about 2,250 for the Americans, so it was asymmetrical. The purpose of Vladivostok was to take SALT, which only had a five-year lifespan, and find a way of extending it to prepare for a SALT II agreement. Vladivostok was symmetrical. It established a 2,400 launch launchers, a limit of 2,400 launchers 
for both the United States and the Soviet Union. When Jimmy Carter became president of the United States, he hoped to get away from Vladivostok, to establish a comprehensive agreement instead of going forth Vladivostok. And the Soviets said, absolutely not. We want Vladivostok as the starting point for any negotiations. And that's in, that ended up being what happened, that Vladivostok became the starting point for those negotiations that ultimately led to the SALT II Agreement of 1979, which was limited the number of launchers on both sides to 2,250. So again, symmetrical. So Vladivostok certainly had an impact on SALT II. Now, SALT II was not ratified by the United States, but the two superpowers did agree to maintain those limits uh, until, through the, ninth, until the, well, the mid-1980s. Uh, and then we have new agreements that, that will come into force. So there's certainly a legacy there. Now with Helsinki, um, the Helsinki Agreements, the Conference for, what, uh, for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, CSCE, uh, the conference that established the Helsinki Accords can be traced back to the 1950s, and there were some initial meetings in, the 19, in 1973 at the foreign minister's level. The Helsinki Accords did establish a series of baskets that, among other things, require the signatories, including the Soviet Union, to respect human rights and allow for the free transfer of people across borders. That agreement, those accords, I would argue with you, left a legacy in that they created a small crack within the Soviet system, within the Soviet bloc. You see, for instance, um, monitoring, you see people, uh, organizations established in the Soviet bloc to monitor human rights. Uh, there's a greater interest given toward human rights in Europe. Uh, people begin to speak out a little bit more. We see sol the Solidarity Movement appear in Poland in 1979. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Soviets threatened to invade Poland in 1980, the Carter administration said, uh, we would recommend you not do that, and the Soviets pulled back. So those cracks began to open. Now granted, it the, the Soviets did still crack on, down on dissidents, and it would take the work of Mikhail Gorbachev to really open up the Soviet system. But I think we need to give the Ford administration credit for creating those cracks that began, even, a, even just a small way, yeah. the beginnings of the end of the communist system yeah. in the uh, Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Yeah. There's, a, there's kind of a direct connect between Helsinki and Glasnost and Perestroika with Gorbachev kicked off, correct? Um, in, in the sense that uh, Gorbachev realized that his nation needed to make some changes. I mean, his economy is overheating as a result of high military spending. He needs better relations with Europe. And that's going to require him to make some changes in the way the Soviet Union functions. Um, what Helsinki did is it put the Soviets on notice, you are going to have to make some changes. So in that respect, you can't see that linkage. Yep. My next question. Um, my guess intrigues me as a legacy of President Ford in so much as it can be used as an introspective examination on how divisive our politics have become since 1974. Had Maguez happened in today's environment, we would have seen major congressional hearings, condemnations, perhaps even a threatened impeachment or two. But in 1974, following the evacuation of Saigon, the Maguez incident was first looked on as a success. Newsweek and New York Times all called it successful. However, later governmental reports showed a better light uh, on this event, mainly uh, the failures of the Koteng operation, failures in intelligence gathering. What is your view on the Maigwez incident when looking at the legacy of President Ford? Well, first of all, I think you're spot on. I mean, we didn't have a 24-hour news cycle at this time. You didn't have social media. Um, you, you didn't have the polarized environment you have today. Um, and when you mentioned impeachment, I, I think it was uh, Representative Shabatz who said that in 2016 that impeachment had become a muscle that had atrophied. And it is time to use it more to give strength to that muscle. And so we begin to see calls for impeachment again and again and again and again. Um, so <laughs> um, with, with the Maigues, I mean, we have to remember that the United States had just had pulled out of Vietnam and its last troops out in April, April of 75 that South Vietnam had fallen to the communists, that a war the United States had fought for decades, first with economic military aid 
then with advisors, then with combat troops, and at the loss of 58,000 Americans had come to an end, and the U.S. had lost. Uh, it, it made the United States look weak. Uh, it raised questions about the competence of the military. It certainly led to a division within this country. Um, then a month later, you have the Maiguez incident, where the where Cambodians sees the cargo ship Maiguez, sees the crew, and Ford feels that he needs to show the United States is strong, that it is tough, that it will not be pushed around. And so he made the decision that we are going to use force against the Cambodians to rescue the crew. Now here's the thing. It was a hastily put together operation. It was in many respects haphazard. About 40 Americans died in the process. About 50 were wounded. There were intelligence reports that, were, that the military apparently did, was not aware of or should have been aware of. Uh, that showed that the Cambodians of Koh Tang were much better armed uh, than we realized, and so we took heavier losses than we expected. It certainly did, uh, and it, although the, the crew was rescued, our troops were, that were fighting were pulled out, but again, at the loss of some 40 dead and 50 wounded. It did make uh, Ford look strong in the short run. His approval rating did go up, uh, but it began to raise, as further research was done into this uh, by individuals in the 70s and beyond, there were clear signs that there were mistakes made. Now, in terms of legacy, I want to place that question to a broader context. Vietnam, we have the defeat in Vietnam. We have the Maiguez, which doesn't go very well. And then just a few years later, 1979, or 1980, we have the failed rescue mission. Right. to get the hostages out. You put all of these together, and it really gave the US Armed Forces a black eye. It raised questions about the competence of the armed forces. It raised questions about decision making. And so in combination with these other things, the military began, and, and US officials, civilian officials, began to make changes. The military began an intense PR campaign to improve its image in the United States. This is when you begin to see, for instance, be all that you can be. You know, join the US Army. Uh, we do more before 9 AM than most people do all day. Uh, we see the Goldwater Nichols Reorganization Act passed in 1986 to streamline decision making in the military to avoid problems like this. So in that respect, the Maiguez did leave a legacy, but a legacy of us realizing that changes were necessary in the way these operations are handled. Great, thank you. When examining the legacy of President Ford, it is impossible to escape his handling of New York City and its financial failings. In the 1976 election, Carter won New York by 289,000 votes. Nixon won by millions in 72. Did Ford's fiscal conservatism cost him New York and the election? Well, little background here. New York City had found itself in a severe financial crisis. Uh, the population had been declining in the city, yet it was still paying um, city workers large sums of money. It was unable to, uh, it wasn't big enough taxes in for those payments, and it found itself in a large debt. And so New York City wanted a bailout, and Ford said, uh, you got yourself in this mess, you get yourself out. And that led one New York City newspaper to have it as, as a... The New York yeah, Daily News. Yeah, yeah, the New York Daily News. Uh, Ford, what, Ford to city dropped Drop dead. That. Uh, which did make Ford look very good. I have no doubt that Ford telling the city to drop dead did not help him come 1976, come the general election. But I would also add there were other things as well. The pardon still resonated. Uh, there were economic issues. The economy was looking weak. Uh, you had Ford's comment that there was no Soviet domination over Eastern Europe, which he made during, his, during the second debate. So a combination of things that raised questions about Ford's competence. You would add also changing the vice president to well, the vice president from, so like from Kansas. Yes, yeah, we could talk about that too, absolutely. <laughs> that, that, from, so Nelson that, that, yeah, from Nelson Rockefeller. From Rockefeller, New York. Nelson Rockefeller to Robert yeah. Dole, yes, yes. Thank you for reminding me. So, <laughs> so uh, that, didn't, that did not help either. So a lot of questions raised about Ford's competence and um, that certainly did not help Ford uh, come, come the general election. 
Prior to your conclusion in your book, which we will get to into right after this question, your final section is titled, History Will Treat Him Well. Has it? And, what, and, and to follow up with that, what in your estimation is President Ford's greatest legacy or achievement? Let me start with the last part of that question. I think in terms of legacy or achievement, he brought integrity back to the Oval Office at a time when it was really low and people questioned our leaders. In terms of his legacy, um, the, the quote uh, came, from a, um, came from Sam Nunn, a former Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia, the history would treat him well, because Sam Nunn argued that Ford did bring integrity back to the Oval Office. Has it, however. Um, in that same section, I end with an article from Time Magazine in 2016. What Time Magazine was looking at was the Republican Party. And the title of the article was, What Happened to This Party? The party of Reagan had continued to move further to the right, away from Reagan's ideals. Reagan himself could be very pragmatic, and yet the party had been moving away from those ideals. The hyper-partisanship that we are dealing with today was certainly apparent by 2016. And I think one way to look at Ford's legacy is from the point of view of that hyperpartisanship. One of the argu arguments I make is that I think if Ford was alive today, you would have a lot of people calling him a rhino, a Republican in name you only. You mentioned this in your book yes. a couple occasions. Yes, a Republican in name only. Um, and I think that would be very true. I mean, the ideas. I hate to say this, but the ideas of bipartisanship, compromise, those have become dirty words in too many cases. Um, we're unable to talk with one another, to debate one another in a cordial manner, instead yelling, fighting, calling each other names. Um, so in that respect, I hate to say it, but I think that the bipartisanship the decorum that Ford would love to have left, at least right now, is not there. The other way to look at it is how Ford has been rated by scholars. Um, if you look at the, um, review, the ratings of, by scholars of, the, of our presidents, Ford generally ranks in the mid to low 20s, sometimes as low as 30. Now, we can discuss the reasons why. Um, that he was seen as just a caretaker president whose only, the only, leg the only thing he ever did was to pardon Richard Nixon. Uh, that uh, he was only, he never had a mandate of his own. He did not get elected on his own. That a lot of the policies he adopted were policies that began under Richard Nixon. Um, that he couldn't win, an, couldn't win an election in his own right. Whatever reasons you want to give, um, he is still ranked as kind of a mediocre president. So in that respect as well, uh, I think that the legacy that Ford would have liked to have left is not there. And let me just add that for those people, and I talk about this in the book, for those people who argue that Ford's legacy is that of a caretaker president whose only major accomplishment was to pardon Richard Nixon, I think that's very unfair. Um, we have here an individual who, yes, did continue many policies begun under Richard Nixon whether we talk about SALT, or we talk about the Panama Canal Treaties, or we talk about efforts at achieving energy independence. But he was also someone who promoted deregulation. We can talk about Helsinki. We can talk about the effort to restore integrity to the White House. And we can talk about the bipartisanship that he worked so hard to continue at a time when the partisanship was beginning to appear in this country. Those are things I think that need to be looked at as well, but unfortunately they're oftentimes ignored when it comes to his legacy. Yep. I apologize for the length of this next question. No, that's I think it's important. Uh, of all the bios on Ford and all the conclusions out there on him, I find yours the most intriguing and captivating in its analysis. You write the following. Speaking of Ford, he remained loyal to Republicans who ran for office, even if he did not always agree with their policies. But he began to reach out to Democrats, particularly Jimmy Carter. Moreover, he began to stake out positions that he never would have taken as a lawmaker or as a president. He became more critical of Israel, endorsed the right to an abortion, homosexual rights, opposed the abolition of the assault weapons ban, and expressed dismay at the continued rightward drift of his own party. 
You end with a quote from the eulogy given by Michigan Congressman John Dingell, the longest serving member of Congress in American history. I ask that you, quoting, quoting him, I ask that you and my fellow colleagues join me in remembering President Ford and honor him by carrying out his legacy of bipartisanship in the years to come. And you end with your own words, it is an entreaty that has been forgotten in Washington. My question, Scott, is did the Ford's post-presidency period have an impact on these viewpoints, or was he always this man? I think he was always this man, but he was constrained. Um, there are three themes I, work, I, I develop in the book. Ford as an ambitious individual who wanted to become Speaker of the House, uh, never did, then became President of the United States through a series of unprecedented events, realized he liked the job, and wanted to try to win the presidency in his own right. Second one is partisanship. Uh, he was loyal to the Republican Party. He was Republican through and through. But he wasn't an ideologue. And that brings me to the third theme, pragmatism. He was a pragmatic partisan. He was someone who was willing to reach across party lines. Uh, he supported over about 80% of, of John F. Kennedy's foreign policies. There were elements of the fair deal proposed by Harry Truman that he liked. He was willing to reach across the aisles. And so this reaching across to Jimmy Carter, as far as I'm concerned, is something, something that was natural to him. It comes from that Midwestern conservatism, that pragmatism, uh, that, that, again, that willingness to, to compromise, mm -hmm. to, to reach out to the other side. Um, but one thing we have to remember, if you are a member of Congress, you represent your district, you represent your state. When you're president of the United States, you represent the people of the United States of America. You also have the voices of 535 members of Congress that you're going to have to deal with. And so how you approach issues is going to be affected because you need to make compromises. You may have to take positions that you possibly don't favor. You may have to, you may see a bill you like. We can talk about with Ford's energy policies, for instance. There were elements that, of, of legislation that was passed that he liked, parts of it he didn't like, but there was enough there that he liked, he was willing to take it. Um, so you have to make those compromises sometimes. Even if you don't want to, you have to. Once Ford was free to those constraints as president, and even he himself said this in 1978, he was liberated. He could talk about these issues more freely, take those positions without having to worry about the political ramifications of doing so. So that is part of the reason why he's taking these positions. And again, as I said, there's that, that pragmatism to begin with, which is why he's reaching out to Carter and willing to work with Carter. I would also point out Betty's role in all of this. I think we have to think about Betty Ford. I mean, Betty Ford was somebody who took viewpoints that were opposite to viewpoints Ford took as president. Very outspoken, for instance, in support of abortion. She gave an uh, interview to Morley Safer in what, July of, August of 75, um, where she talked about her support for Roe versus Wade, where she said that, uh, so what, people live together before marriage. Uh, yeah, maybe I tried marijuana, wouldn't be surprised if my kids did. And she got a huge amount of flack for that. And her husband, Gerald, uh, Jerry, said to her, you cost me 10 million votes. No, you cost me 20 million votes. I mean, he's saying this half jokingly. But there was some seriousness there. He's worried about what those comments are going to have upon his political fortunes, upon his political future. Once he's no longer president, Betty's there saying the same things. Hey, you know what? You may be onto something here, honey. And there are those individuals who knew the Fords who said, yeah, we would not be, we think that Betty had some impact as well upon those viewpoints. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we should always be thinking about Betty Ford. <laughs> uh, let's move to the Ford and Carter relationship. Yes. Uh, I'm going to read an excerpt, uh, excerpt from your book on the relationship. The 1976 election campaign had left the two men feeling bitter toward one another. When the State Department determined it was too dangerous to send President Reagan or VP Bush to the Anwar, this funeral for Anwar Sadat, Carter, Ford, and Nixon were asked to lead the delegation. Their transport, an old Boeing 707, was cramped with the former presidents. As the jets flew across the Atlantic, excuse me, Nixon could sense that the two were still at ease with one another, and he broke the ice. 
We were all former presidents who served our country well, remembered Ford. So there was no reason for any residual bad blood between us. Nixon brought us all together. Who knew? Mm -hmm. uh, the resentments between the 38th and the 39th presidents uh, quickly dissipated as they discovered their commonalities. Both of them were religious. Both had rivals, uh, had been rivals of Reagan. Both had known Sadat, and they shared a similar perspective of American diplomacy. By all accounts, this friendship went very, very deep. How often did they follow, uh, how often did they meet following this trip, and what other things did they collaborate on during their friendship? Oh, well, they met in 1985 at the Carter Center. It wasn't just them, it was other U.S. officials as well as Soviet officials, including uh, the former Soviet ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Dobrynin, to discuss arms control. Following the attacks on the World Trade Center in 2001, they were there, along with George W. Bush, so they were there together. Uh, and they, they involved themselves, they were, uh, worked together in a number of initiatives. Uh, they were very outspoken about Middle East peace. They wrote an article in Reader's Digest magazine in 1983 criticizing Israel for building settlements in the West Bank. Uh, they opposed protectionism, wanted to see protectionism, as, thought protectionism as a danger. Uh, prior, to the night, prior to George W. Bush's inauguration, they wrote a piece together suggesting that the next president of the United States should focus on arms control and reducing the deficit. Uh, Bush did not follow those <laughs> recommendations. Um, they supported NAFTA in the 1990s. During the Monica Lewinsky scandal, they both argued that, uh, uh, that uh, Bill Clinton should be censured rather than impeached. Uh, following the events of the 2000 election, they argued that they uh, were part of a commission calling for changes to the way that elections were run. Uh, and that led to actually the Help, what, the Help America Vote Act which called for things such as some minimum voter ID requirements and providing money to update um, existing uh, machinery to count votes. Uh, and they also called for continuing, continuing the assault weapons ban that was set to expire in 2004. So they corresponded a lot, they agreed a lot on issues, and yes, they did get together sometimes in person to promote a, a variety of initiatives. Mm -hmm. There have been some very famous presidential friendships in American history. Adams and Jefferson and their famous correspondents, Theodore Roosevelt and Howard Taft also come to mind. But I think we have to say that Ford and Carter's post-presidential relationship was something very special. How does this friendship rank among other relationships between former presidents? Well, of course, Adams and Jefferson may be the most famous just because of the, the lengthy correspondence they had where Adams was trying to defend himself during his presidency. Um, but I would place the Ford-Carter relationship high up there. I mean, again, here were two individuals who were, who were rivals. Um, Carter said some things about Ford about his leadership, or lack thereof, during the 1976 campaign that Ford took very hard. Uh, Ford was very critical of Carter during his administration, criticized him on economic issues, criticized him on SALT II, um, felt that Carter should have talked with him more during the run hostage crisis. But they found a way to get through that and to work together on these issues. And they set a precedent. They set a precedent of the idea of post-presidents working together on a common cause, whatever that cause may be. And we see that continuing to this day. Uh, George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton working together to help the victims of what, the 2005 tsunami. Uh, George W. Bush and Bill Clinton working together to develop a scholars program uh, to encourage college students, for instance, to work on solving local, state, international issues. Uh, we saw a number of ex-presidents get together to try to help the victims of Hurricane Irma uh, and Harvey in, what, 2014, if I remember the year correctly. So they set that precedent there. Um, but I want to add one more thing to your question here, because I think it's something else that, that we should think about, and that is their wives. Yes. The impact their wives had. Their wives also were political rivals. Um, Betty Ford said of Rosalind Carter during the 1976 campaign that Rosalind Carter was saccharine sweet, but always ready to stick a knife in your back. Uh, you know, that, that still magnolia, that view of, of Rosalind Carter is still magnolia. Um, and, and so they had a rivalry there as well, but they found common cause. We know about Betty's issues with alcoholism and drug addiction. 
Well, Rosalind Carter had a longstanding interest in helping people with mental health issues. Well, those two things, I mean, if, if you're alcoholism, um, drug addiction, those kinds of things do affect your mental health. Well, they found a common cause there that they could work together on helping those individuals dealing with those kinds of mental health challenges that could be affected by alcohol, could be affected by drug use. So they too are working together. And I think that helped strengthen. This is one thing that, that I think future scholars might want to look into. That helps strengthen, as far as I'm concerned, the relationship that Jerry, and Jimmy Car Jerry Ford and Jimmy Carter had because their wives had that relationship as well. So this is my last question. This is more for the students that are out there in the audience that I see. Uh, you write in your book, uh, what, scholars, what scholars have devoted less attention to is the significance of the partnership that Ford and Carter developed. For many of our UM grads or PhD student students out there, what can future scholars do to add to the scholarship on this historical and important friendship? Research. <laughs> Um, I'm going to get myself right here, right? Right here. Oh, absolutely. Right here. Absolutely. Got to start here. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to get myself in a little trouble here. Um, my father wrote a book a number of years ago on ex presidents. Um, and he's not the only one. There's a book called The President's Club that came out around the same time. There's a new book that just came out this year on seven accidental presidents. Um, but those books, I think, could be added on to. Um, I, my father, for instance, and I'm, I hope he's not going to watch this. I'm criticizing him. Um, my father talked, his chapter in what he covers Ford is, is, refers to marketing the presidency. That Ford used his, ex, his years as an ex-president to market himself, to make money so he could build the Ford Library and Ford, Ford Museum, but also make money for himself. What I argue is there's more to Ford's ex-presidency than that. There's this relationship between Carter and Ford as well mm -hmm. that exists there. Um, but there are certainly more papers out there that uh, are available. I know when I was doing research at the Bentley Library about some of Ford's, uh, Ford's ex-presidential years, there were still documents that were not available. Well, maybe they are now. Or see what the Carter Library has that might be available. But the other thing I think that we could look at as well, and this comes back to what we were just talking about, look at their wives too. See the relationship they had with one another. I'll give you a good example. I've written a, a, a biography of Rosalind Carter. Jimmy Carter called Rosalind Carter, uh, considered Rosalind Carter. He said, she's an extension of me. He once said that, as president, he said, with the exception of a few top secret materials that I can't talk to her about, she knows virtually everything that's going on in this administration. She was one of his top advisors. They had a very close relationship. And in fact, there's a history of first ladies having a close relationship, even acting as advisors to their husbands. Uh, we could talk about Grace Coolidge. We could talk about Lou Henry Hoover. We could talk about Eleanor Roosevelt. We could talk about Betty Ford. Look out as well at their wives. There has not really been a lot of work done on uh, ex-first ladies. What impact did wives have on their husbands? Not just on their husbands in terms of what they were doing as ex-presidents, but on the relationships they developed with other ex-presidents. That's something I think mm -hmm. that, that our students could look into. Well, I am done with my questions, and now it is time for your questions. Uh, please raise your hand if you, if you have a question for Dr. Kaufman. All right, I'm going to step down. My job here is done. OK. Thanks for an interesting program. Thank you. Uh, most people are aware that a president just doesn't step into the Oval Office and start doing things all by himself. He has multitudinous staff members. Uh, when Mr. Nixon left the White House, there were not very many staff members left of, of whom we knew. Many of them were facing charges or already perhaps uh, paying for their crimes. How long does it take an accidental president to come into office and to say, okay, I need to fill 
this, 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 and this spot with people I can trust and people that the country can trust. Well, again, that's going to vary from president to president. Um, and and um, in Ford's case, you're right. I mean, this happened so quickly. So he had to bring in members of his own staff. Um, and he also said, I'm going to keep people who were working for Nixon in place. Uh, as he said, Al Haig is an example of that. He says, you don't want, you need a pilot for the plane. You don't want to remove the pilot and have the plane crash. So you want to keep Al Haig in, in, in position, in, in that position, uh, to kind of help coordinate things until such time as I think maybe somebody else will be needed. That did cause problems for him because you had people like Robert Hartman, who was Ford's chief speechwriter, who referred to these Nixon holdovers as the proletarian guard, uh, that they couldn't be trusted. They were working at odds with Ford's staff. Um, Ford took some grief as well for not trying to, they, there were complaints made that Ford was too nice, that he wasn't dealing with these issues between Nick, the Nixon holdovers and his own staff. But it really places the, the president in a difficult situation. So he is going to have to figure out, what do I do to keep things running? And in Ford's case, it was, OK, I want to keep who I have, who I can keep, in place for the time being. Bring in my staff as well. Hopefully, everyone will work together, and we can keep things going. But I need someone to, to pilot the plane for the time being. Any questions? They can come back here. I spoke with my friend at the floor. <laughs> Um, well, Rockefeller is an interesting figure in all of this. Uh, he did not want to be just uh, the vice president. Um, I'm trying to remember what exact words were. So, it wasn't him. I think it was um, Garner who said the vice presidency is the, the spare tire of government. He didn't want to be that. He wanted to have some real authority. Um, and Ford, Ford tried to give him some real authority over domestic counsel. The problem that he ran into was when he brought Donald Rumsfeld in to help act as coordinator, Rumsfeld said, we really can't, I, I don't want to give Rockefeller that kind of power. Uh, and you began to see this dynamic appear where Rockefeller and Rumsfeld are working at odds with one another. Uh, and so that did cause some, some serious problems. Um, and then when it came, of course, to the time, to election time, and there were questions Ford was having about whether Rockefeller was the actual person he wanted running as his running mate and deciding, no, I want to do that. Well, as we just talked about, that had an impact as well in 1976. Um, but Rockefeller really did want to have some significant power, but he'd find himself at odds with individuals in the administration that, that limited the power he wanted to have. So the, 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 I just give you a long answer, for, uh, which could have been shortened. But yes, my analysis is that um, he wanted some real power, but, but found himself at odds with other members of the administration. Any other questions? Oh. I think go ahead. Go, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So I know towards the end, and close to the end of the fall, or the fall of Saigon, um, I think it was the White House photographer and another uh, Ford's aides came back, and Ford asked them, you know, what was what was the what was the case over there, and they had said it was in dire straits. And uh, I know that it was one of the first times that Ford had, or even a president had met with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee since I think the Wilson administration. And they suggested $500 million uh, to, keep the, to keep Saigon from falling. If that would have happened and the Senator and, the, and Congress would have approved of that, what would the Ford uh, administration end up like? If the money had been approved? Yeah. Well, Ford had requested was $722 million. Um, and, and members of Congress said, uh, no, we're not doing that. Um, 
how much, I, I, I can't, it's always hard to answer a counterfactual, but given how fast the South Vietnamese army was collapsing in the face of the offensive that was already taking place by North Vietnam, even the North Vietnamese were shocked as to how fast they were moving forward. I don't think the money would have made much difference. Um, and I can go into a long, I mean, I teach an entire class in the Vietnam War, so I can give an entire lecture on all of this. But you had, there were, there were divisions of the Vietnamese, or South, the South Vietnamese only that fought very well, the 1st Marine Division as an example. But this was an army infused with corruption. Um, Nguyen Van Tu, the president of South Vietnam, had a habit of naming generals, not because they were competent, but because they were loyal. Um, and the army was so spread out, the logistics were so bad, that the army began to collapse very, very quickly. Uh, again, the North Vietnamese were shocked as how fast they were moving forward. So I don't think the money would have made much difference. I have one more question is about the, the Mayans. I know that in 1973 they passed the War Powers Act. Mm -hmm. I know in Ford's book he talks about that being, you know, on his mind when he was committing troops to rescue the Mayans. How did that end up playing out in Congress? Was there any discrepancies with, you know, him taking action and the War Powers Act being passed? There were some individuals who felt that he should have consulted with Congress in advance before doing this, but his argument was, I need to make a decision now. We had to take action quickly. Um, and, and so, um, and again, the response of, from most members of Congress in the end was a very positive one. Thank you. We have time for a few more. If you're interested, please head in the back. Uh, did Ford have any significant involvement in any of the subsequent presidential elections? And what do you think he would be doing if he was alive today? Oh, boy. <laughs> Well, let me answer the first part of the question. Absolutely, he was involved in subsequent presidential elections. He consistently campaigned uh, for Republicans for president. There was even talk for a while of him being uh, Ronald Reagan's running mate in 1980, which ultimately fell through. Uh, but he was out there campaigning. Oh, boy. Second part of the question. Um, I think Ford would be absolutely appalled with the state of American politics today. Um, he was, even when he was alive, he began to worry about the polarization that was taking place. He argued that the reason why Bob Dole lost in 1996 to Bill Clinton was because Dole was pulled too far to the right. Ford himself was, was a moderate conservative, and he was worried about the country moving so far, so far to the right. I think his, what he would see now, and I may be getting some, may get some, myself in some trouble here, is that he would see a Republican Party that no longer abides by the ideals that he believed he believed in as a Republican. That it's a party that is focused more on an individual rather than on an ideology. Uh, the very fact that Dick Cheney, who worked in his campaign, served as his chief of staff, is supporting Kamala Harris is, I think, a su su is suggestive of where Ford would be now that he would see adherence to the Constitution as vitally important. And the direction that his party, that he so strongly believed in, the direction it's going, as something that would scare him to death. Last question. Thank you for being here tonight, Scott. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you a bit of a what if question. And what do we know about how Gerald Ford was planning to govern had he been elected on his own right to a full term? You talk in the book a lot about some of the challenges he faced during his presidency, developing his own vision, his own approach to things that he could articulate to the country, in part because he inherited all the Nixon operations that he had not been elected. But what can we learn from how he was preparing, particularly in 1976, that he caught Carter and won, in terms of appointments, his style, his thrust in policy? Would we have seen significant differences from the, the caretaker period, or would it have been more of an extension of that, to the extent that we can know? Again, a tough question to answer, but I think we would have seen a president who would have worked very hard to maintain that bipartisanship. I think we would have seen a president who continued to try to continue the country down that moderate conservative path because it's what he always believed in. An individual would reach out uh, across party lines. 
I think we would have seen a president who would continue many of the initiatives that he'd begun, or that had been, been begun before him, or that he himself begun, whether it be deregulation, SALT II, the Panama Canal treaties. Um, I also think one thing we would have seen if he had the opportunity to do it is that he would have done something that Carter said that he would have done if he had the opportunity, to name the first female Supreme Court justice. Um, when he chose, what was it, Stevens, uh, Betty Ford got at him about that as Supreme Court justice. I think he would have done it if he had had the opportunity. Um, so I think he would have continued a lot of what he did um, because he saw that as the right thing to do. Um, but I think he would have also staked out some new initiatives such as uh, a female Supreme Court justice, a woman Supreme Court justice. Okay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Dr. We have a small little gift to for you, sir. I even have to. Uh, the Gerald R. Ford Christmas ornament. <laughs> oh! <laughs> so, for your tree this holiday season. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. I, I'm very happy that someone had mentioned someone um, who we are really looking forward to seeing here in the future. Uh, you had mentioned uh, the, uh, the photographer who had went uh, to Vietnam. He really? will be here next year. Wow. Uh, Dr. Uh, David Kennerly, uh, the president's photographer, will be here. Um, I believe it's going to be April. We have a date set up already. Pay attention to our newsletters. Sorry? March. It's in March. Uh, he'll be both here and at the museum. And we are really looking forward uh, to him being here next year. Thank you very much. Thank you.